Have you ever visited a hospital and spent more than 30 Have you ever visited a hospital and spent more than 30 minutes waiting to obtain a hospital card? After obtaining the card, wait another 30 minutes to see a doctor. How did these waits make you feel? What if Have you ever visited a hospital Have you ever visited a hospital and spent more than 30 minutes waiting to obtain a hospital card? After obtaining the card, wait another 30 minutes to see a doctor. How did these waits make you feel? What if I told you you could consult your doctor on your mobile device for non-life-threatening conditions anytime, anywhere? Wouldn't that be great? How, you ask? By registering at www.completecare.com. This registration is free and simple. You not only get to consult a doctor on your mobile device, but can book appointments to see your doctor at the hospital. Better still, you could have your doctor visit you at home. Isn't that wonderful? Enter your details here and experience the easiest and fastest access to a doctor or hospital. Do you know that this reduces the cost of you consulting medical experts and the logistics of doing so by 30 to 70%? Do you know that this reduces the time you spend in hospital to the barest minimum and gives you time to attend to other things? Do you know that you can pay online when you need medical care and enjoy the best of medical care from qualified medical doctors from anywhere and anytime? Hurry now and register and benefit from cutting edge healthcare revolution in Nigeria. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our viewers. Welcome to everyone joining us this evening to celebrate the World Hepatitis Day. Welcome, Dr. Ken De Okene. Okena. Okay, then welcome. Man. So we're Thanks. celebrating the World Hepatitis Day today, um, which is tagged protecting your liver keys to a hepatitis-free life. So for today, our guest um, speaker today will be Dr. Kainde, and she'll be um, explaining to us how we can protect our liver and how we can be, um, live a better life and to be hepatitis free. So thank you very much, Doctor, for joining us once again. Thank you to our viewers for joining this evening. So this um, broadcast is brought to us by Complete Care. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Doc. So this webinar is brought to us by Complete Care. It's a digital health marketplace that connects patients with doctors and other health care professionals within the shortest time possible. Complete Care is your sure health plug for convenient, affordable, and quality health care. So without much ado, we'll just go straight to the business of today. Um, so we'll be asking our guest speaker for today some questions, and she'll be explaining um, to us to let us know better how to take care of our livers and how to live hepatitis free. So, Dr. Kainde, I'll be asking you some questions, ma. So, I'm just going to proceed to the first question, which says, um, "Can you tell us what hepatitis is, ma?" Okay, so um, hepatitis is the inflammation of the liver cells, and of course, it can be. It can occur as a result of um, infection. Uh, it can be caused by infection. It can be caused by common medications, which um, we, we we use over the counter medications like um, acetaminophen, which is like the par common paracetamol that we use. Even drugs like um, oral contraceptives, which some women use to prevent pregnancy, can also um, Cause um, viral hepatitis can also cause hepatitis. Other medications such as um, the one that is used to lower the blood cholesterol level can also predispose a patient to having hepatitis. Antibiotics, even the common septrin that we have around, can also um, cause hepatitis. Of course, there are other causes such as infectious causes. We have viruses that can cause um, hepatitis and they are commonly caused by um, um, hepatitis um, B, hepatitis C virus. We also have other viruses like hepatitis A. We have hepatitis um, D, E. And also um, we have some other types 
um, which are less common. We also have the autoimmune, which means that even the liver cells itself can fight itself and also cause hepatitis. So um, basically, it's, it just simply means that the liver is inflamed and it commonly results, most commonly of all the um, causes that I've list listed or I've mentioned, um, it's the viruses that are commonly implicated. All right, we also have um, uh, okay. We also have it can be acute, it can be chronic. It's acute when it occurs less than when you have a, a, someone coming down with hepatitis in less than six months. Sometimes it can resolve on its own, particularly the acute form, or it can now progress to become chronic. Of course, if it lasts longer than six months, then um, can can that's that's when we have the chronic um, hepatitis thank you so much all right thank you very much doc for the extensive answer so i'll be moving on to our next questions now which says how is hepatitis linked to the liver okay so um of course like i said i said um, hepatitis if you can remember what i defined as hepatitis is that inflammation of the liver cells mm -hmm. because if we don't have the liver cells um there can be hepatitis so it's okay. it's just like an um aberration of the liver cells when it becomes inflamed and of course there are so many things that can cause this which i've listed earlier before now this can now cause the liver damage sometimes it can scar the liver and then make the liver and that's when you have what we call liver cirrhosis it makes it difficult for your liver to perform its regular functions that is meant to perform and eventually if it's not well taken care of it can lead to liver failure just like we have kidney failure, we have heart failure. That means that at that point in time, the liver is unable to carry out its main function that it's meant to carry out. And then um, you would be needing a more that sort of interventions to correct that. All right, thank you very much, Doc. Um, so our next question says, what is the significance of the word hepatitis D? and the tag. So the tag says protecting your liver keys to a hepatitis free life. So what is the significance of this tag of this um, year 2023 World Hepatitis Day? Okay, so um, every year more than a million lives are lost as a result of um, hepatitis and this year's um, theme um, every 28th of July, we celebrate the World Hepatitis Day. Yesterday, it was celebrated globally all over the world. And it's just to um, create like an awareness about what hepatitis is all about and um, how we can help people who are already infected with hepatitis, how we can create awareness for those that are not even infected and you want to prevent them from being infected. So. Um, this year's theme, protecting the uh, liver, mm -hmm. is um, a subtle plea for um, the whole um, world, uh, for people around the world to take action and not to wait. It means that um, you don't have to wait um, because sometimes it can be, it can, a patient can um, present without symptoms or even an individual can present without any symptoms. So um, you don't want to wait till that time when the disease has progressed and that's when you now want to um, um, intervene. So it's, it's we're not waiting for change. You just want to take actions right, uh, like right, uh, right away. And the plea is just for everybody to get tested, to know their status, so that if you know early, you can now prevent progression of this um, um, hepatitis to the advanced um, stage. And again, um, the primary purpose is also, like I said, to promote the to prevent um, hepatitis, also to get tested, know your status, and then treatment can be instituted for those that are advanced and we can also support those that are already infected um, with hepatitis globally. 
and of course because we know that hepatitis is um, a significant public health threat um, it's it's important to emphasize the importance of uh, uh, making an early um, diagnosis and improving access to care for particularly for those who are in need of it all right thank you doc um so we're moving right um, away to our next questions, um, which says, how can we prevent, uh, how can we protect our liver? How can we take care of our liver? Okay, so um, there are various ways to protect the liver. And, and the question we should ask ourselves is, why should I even protect my liver? One, because um, vi um, um, Viral hepatitis that affects the liver is one of the leading causes of death globally. And of course, um, there are some studies that have said it accounts for up to about 1.34 million um, related deaths every single year. And of course, there's always one chronic, new chronic infection every 10 seconds. So that tells us how much um, impact this um, condition as on human beings generally, globally. It's not a, it's not something that is just peculiar to a particular part of the world. It's, it's, it's something that affects um, every part of the world. So um, all individuals in every part of the world and because there are different types. And the most concerning is that, um, you know, about 8,000 new infections are even reported every day. And some will even go undetected. So. The liver is such an important organ that um, if there is um, a damage to it, it can't survive a few days before it will shut down. It can't survive more than one day or so before it will shut down. So um, it has so many functions because um, the toxins that build up in our body, that's um, the toxins that we have in our body, the, the, it's the liver that helps us to um, take out those toxins that by detoxifying our body. So, of course, it performs silently, it can perform more than 500 functions every single day to keep us um, going. So, the liver is so important because it, it's an organ that stores, help us stores vitamins, sugar, um, different uh, iron. In fact, it helps us to clear our waste products. Some medications that we use that are, are metabolized, they are excreted via the liver. Of course, if there are some poisonous substances ingested, it's the liver that takes care of it. It also helps us to produce some clotting factors that prevent us from bleeding excessively when we have cuts. So we can see that, um, and the list is endless. So we can see that the liver has so many functions that they cannot be overlooked. Uh, so it's very, it's very important that we take care of the liver. It's very important that um, we eat well, we eat right, so that at least um, uh, we can preserve the function of the liver. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Doc. So I'm just going to um, um, ask this question. So what um, are the uh, food or fruits that we can eat that is going to help um, take care of our liver? better okay. okay thank you so um we have so many we we, we have we're meant to eat right at all times because the benefits um outweighs the risk so we we need to eat healthy there are some food that are very good for the liver and um things like fruits fruits like um grapefruits even berries we, we have um we, we come across um, strawberries sometimes here, yeah. but um, sometimes cranberries, blueberries. Rarely um, we get those ones, but shops like um, ShopRite, you can easily get those ones there. Also, um, vegetables like cabbage, they're readily available in this part of the world. Um, and we've been seeing cauliflower, broccoli, and um, beans is also a very common um food that we have around in this part of the world which is equally very good eggs um whole grains 
um, then beetroot is very good. People have um, made beetroot juices in, um, we, we get them around, we can get to the market, buy the beetroot. And um, also low fat milk is advisable over um, using a full cream milk. Soya milk is also very good. They, help, they all help to improve um, liver function. Of course, there are some food that we, they, we should avoid if um, we have, um, if we want um, to maintain the liver health and such food include red meat, um, some processed foods like um, sausages that you see people buying around, um, even alcohol intake should be reduced those are the beverages that we can cut down on to improve the liver health thank you all right thank you very much doc so i'll be moving on to the next question um what are the primary challenges or complexities associated with chronic hepatitis that differentiates it from the acute hepatitis okay um Quite a number of the world's population is um, affected, about 350 million from a study done. Uh, they are infected with um, hepatitis. They have chronic hepatitis. Of course, because we know that uh, there are some life-threatening conditions that may now result from um, having an advanced um, or untreated um chronic um, hepatitis, um, hepatitis infection. Of course, and with it being uh, things like um, hepatocellular carcinoma, which is like the cancer of the liver, and of course being the most prevalent, fifth, uh, fifth most prevalent um, cancer in the whole world. Um, there are so, so many challenges that we have uh, that can be associated with chronic uh, hepatitis, particularly in this part of the world. One, unlike the acute viral hepatitis, all the all most people infected with chronic hepatitis um, will require um, extensive um, follow up and assessment. You know, to prove to check for the degree there is a liver damage, to know the degree of the liver damage, and those um, investigations are quite. Um, ex expensive they are not um, the, the cost implications of it you can't compare to a person who simply has um, acuviral hepatitis which will likely be self-limiting and resolve even without um, any um, specific um, treatment so um, it's more expensive to manage as compared with um, acuviral hepatitis and also there is lack of um, diagnostic facilities um, for particularly hepatitis B uh, virus DNA viral, uh, you know, you know, in order to do the viral load, viral assay, it's not all centers that um, carry out this investigation. And of course, maybe about six centers currently can do that in the country. So, but it's a bit um, um, expensive to carry out. You see some patients on the average, by the time they are doing the hepatitis B panel test, by the time they are doing this um, viral load, they are, they, are, they are spending close to 40,000, 25,000, depending on where they are even accessing care. So imagine if we now have people in the rural communities who barely can afford um, a meal a day, then you, you're asking them to um, pay that much for their investigation. One, they have to travel out of their uh, comfort zones to um, to go and run this test. Some of them don't even have, but they can't afford the transport, let alone this investigation. So these are the challenges that we have. Of course, there are shortage of personnel too. And in Nigeria, we have very few gastroenterologists. There are not so many. You know, we know our population is expanding every day. And of course, we have so many people coming down with um, yeah. hepatitis or those that have uh, the existing condition. So we can see that there's a shortage of personnel who are trained in that field to care for these individuals. And of course, um, all these are the complexities that we have with people who now have chronic hepatitis as compared with those that have um, um, acute hepatitis. 
All right, thank you, Doc, for that extensive explanation. So we're just going to proceed right next to the question. Um, can you uh, explain the long-term implications of untreated chronic hepatitis on the patient's liver and the overall well-being of a patient that has chronic untreated um, hepatitis? Okay, so um, like I said, um, when I started explaining, I mentioned inflammation of the liver cells, sometimes causing scarring, sometimes resulting in um, what we call um, um, cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is that there's the liver tissue becomes scarred. And so we sometimes it, at this level, it becomes irreversible. The liver begins to shrink. It can't perform the function it's meant to perform. And of course, with time, if it and it becomes um, it, it becomes um, it, it leads the patient to having a um, liver failure. Of course, if the cirrhosis is severe, that is the shrinkage and um, adding of the liver cells. Let me put it in in simple terms like that. That's what cirrhosis is. Then, of course liver failure can occur. And this means that the liver is unable to filter waste, remove the toxins that we have from the body, and also the drugs that are consumed cannot be metabolized, cannot be excreted. It means they cannot even no longer produce that clotting factor. If you remember as part of the functions that I mentioned, I said it allows our blood, it produces some factors that allow our blood to clot. So. It means that bleeding cannot even stop for this individual. So you see that those that eventually present in the hospital with the advanced form, they have all of the symptoms. And of course, with liver failure, sometimes some of them can have, um, from this liver cirrhosis, some of them can even have progressed to a liver cancer stage. And of course, with all of this, it's patient can you know, eventually die from all of these complications. And of course, if it's untreated, it's, there's a burden on the patient himself, whether financial burden, uh, whether psychological burden, even for the caregivers, the person caring for that patient, there's a burden on that. We have a caregiver burden. If it's a chronic, if it's um, a malignant um, transformation that is if it, if it has um, transformed to um, cancer it means that is a terminal illness even the person caring for this will have to put every, for this individual will have to put everything they are uh, um, doing at that time on hold to care for their uh, loved ones of course there is a burden on that person depends on the age at this which this person is presenting um, even on the nation, if it's occurring in uh, maybe a vibrant young person, it, it, there's also this um, effect he has on the economy of the nation, particularly the productivity of that person. So we can see that um, it has so many effects. There can be psychological effect. Person can be depressed, knowing that oh, this is cancer, this is terminal, uh, this will result in death. You know, even um, spiritually, the person is down. Mentally, the person is down, is depressed. So we, we, the the effect is so wide that other than even the patient that is directly affected even the family members are equally affected friends are affected colleagues are affected and of course um it's something that um, should be prevented if we can if we can prevent it it should be yeah. yes thank you doc so before we proceed i would just like to bring to us once more that this webinar is brought to us by complete care Complete Care is a digital health marketplace that connects patients with doctors and other healthcare professionals within the shortest time possible. So Complete Care is your sure health plug for convenient, affordable, and quality healthcare. Thank you once more to our viewers for joining. And please, um, to our viewers, if you have any questions you would like to ask um, Dr. Kende, please, you can drop it on the chat function and we'll be able to see then Doc will be able to answer. So we're just going to proceed next to 
to the next question. So in your experience, Doc, what are the common risks for chronic hepatitis and how can understanding these risk factors help in prevention efforts? Okay, so it depends on the type of hepatitis we are even looking at. Like I said, we have hepatitis A, we have hepatitis B, we have hepatitis C, we have D, we have E, uh, we have F, G, we have the autoimmune type. So, of course, there are risk factors for each of this. Uh, the hepatitis A is um, more of an acute form of hepatitis and, of course, it's it, the transmission is um, we say fecal oral via um, you know um, poor sanitation if you have um, if there is lack of potable water you know uh, living in an household or, or with or living with a, someone who is infected in the household can put someone at risk of having hepatitis A. Now we have uh, some continents that are even um, endemic for this hepatitis A, like someone traveling to Asia, like an Asian country, sometimes they may require you to, you know, have this um, hepatitis A vaccine even before you get to such areas. Uh, those that um, um, we have some um, sexual orientations in some people, whereby those that um, men you know, having um, some sort of um, relationship with other men, uh, yeah, it puts them at risk of, because of their sexual um, practices, because of their uh, sexual orientation. Of course, like I mentioned, traveling to areas of high, um, high um, incidence of um, hepatitis. high prevalence of um, hepatitis um, A, you know, without yeah. being having the yeah. vaccine and also put some people at risk. Now, for hepatitis B, uh, what are the risk factors for hepatitis B? Of course, this is what most people know about much more than any other form of hepatitis. Things like um, um, having a um, sharing sharp objects with people, you know, mm. that are infected with hepatitis B, razor blade, needles, um, you know, sharp objects generally. Yeah. Um, yes. So, of course, having, um, we can also be contacted through sexual um, intercourse with um, someone who is infected with hepatitis B. For those that also um, inject drugs, nowadays we are having high um, incidence of um, substance abuse whereby people do all sort of drugs, inject themselves. Sometimes they tend to share all the sharp objects. So if you are sh they are sharing needles with people who are already infected, then it puts them at risk. Of course, household members of those that have a, a, a patite, chronic um, hepatitis B infection are also at risk. Of course, for healthcare workers, nurses, working in hospital settings, um, they are also at risk because if you are now handling the body fluids and body blood products of someone who is um, infected with hepatitis B, it puts um, those um, healthcare workers at risk. You know, anyone working in the hospital is at risk of, um, um, of this um, type of hepatitis. Of course, um, um, for hepatitis B, uh, sorry, C. C is also almost similar to hepatitis uh, B, sharing of sharp, sharp objects because B and C often go together. So um, needle stick injury, sharing sharp, sharp objects, um, unprotected um, sexual intercourse are things that can put you at risk. I forgot to mention during um, while I was saying the risk factors for hepatitis B. For B and C, of course, we, there's what we call vertical transmission. That's from mother to child. You can have for a mother who is infected, has very high viral load, um, can also transmit. Um, for B and C. B and C in particular. Okay. You know mother to child transmission is possible in them so the d sometimes does not um, occur in isolation most of the time it occurs 
um, with hepatitis B, of course. So whatever puts a patient at risk of having hepatitis B would also put a patient at risk of having hepatitis D. So for E, it's also for oral, just like A. These factors are almost um, similar. Uh, to one uh, to each other for the autoimmune the, the cause might not even be known you know it's just maybe something the liver cells attacking its own self and you know for those ones there are no specific risk um, for that except if the patient now has an autoimmune disease that puts um, that person at risk of having hepatitis all right, thank you, Doc. Um, so we'll be moving um, to our next question, um, which is um, what preventive measures can individuals take to reduce the risk of contracting hepatitis viruses? Okay, so the preventive measures will be that um, things we can do as individuals to limit uh, exposure to uh, the virus, what are the things we can do? Of course, um, in an hospital setting, there's what we call universal precaution, particularly for healthcare workers. Like I told you, um, people working in the hospital, uh, like I said earlier, people working in the hospital are at very high risk of contacting, yes. you know, hepatitis B mm -hmm. and C in particular. Mm -hmm. So what can we do to limit our exposure? One, we have to protect ourselves. Uh, if we need to undo patients and body fluids, blood products, collect samples, you know, transport uh, a patient who is infected from one place to the other, we need to wear our gloves, sometimes a mask, uh, wearing our gowns, you know, to prevent splashes. Uh, sometimes goggles too, can, because for any infectious individuals, and if you're doing, and I, I uh, a risky procedure for that it's better you wear something like a face shield you know wear your face mask to prevent splash into your eyes to prevent all of those stuff um you know from getting um contacting um hepatitis um b or c then hand washing is very key particularly those type of hepatitis that are uh, contacted via the fecal oral route even for the other types of it for all forms of hepatitis some would say okay i've worn my gloves and that should protect me even after wearing your gloves finishing a procedure or even you are caring for a patient you are a relative of a patient who is infected with hepatitis it's important to perform um you know hand washing um measures you know if you don't even have soap and water they will say, okay, wash for as long as you will sing uh, happy birthday, um, you know, like minimum of about 20 seconds. So it's important to perform hand washing techniques, you know, know how to wash your hands when you come in contact, even if you're living with uh, someone who is infected, you don't want to share um, utensils like cutleries with that person, toothbrush with that person, you know. Hand washing is very important. So those are the ways by which we can limit uh, our exposure. Avoiding sharing sharp objects, you know, with individuals that are infected because you don't want um, a situation, you don't want a situation whereby um, your, um, you don't want a situation whereby um, you, you now have um, someone who is infected, you're sharing sharp objects with that person and that puts you at risk, mm -hmm. yes, of contacting um, hepatitis B. So I think those are the things we should put in, in, in place in order to prevent or in order to limit our risk. Of course, um, before now, those that are being transfused with blood, uh, but you know, those are those are significantly reduced because now, as part of the um, um, routines that is done before you can transfuse, um, you need to screen the blood for hepatitis B, for hepatitis C. You need to screen for HIV. You need to screen for syphilis and all of that. So. Of course, those are also measures that have been put in place, 
you know, to limit um, risk of contacting the hepatitis virus. All right, thank you, Doc. So we'll be taking some questions from our registered, um, from our viewers. So the first question says, why are most liver disease patients, why do they have hypoglycemia? Okay, hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is, uh, um, let's say, the level of um, um, glucose in the blood is really low. And uh, that's the layman's term for describing what hypoglycemia is. We have values, but we might not go into details of that. So um, if we look at the liver, like I said, there are over 500 functions that the liver performs. Of course, we have some pathways. We call it the glycolytic pathways. Those are the pathways by which um, the body uses glucose that are being consumed. And... Those, are, those functions are performed by the liver. So automatically, a patient that has liver disease has that pathway affected. And it means that, yes, what should, what should be like the end product of that pathway that will be useful to the body is being, uh, yes, is being affected. That's like the layman's way of explaining it. So, of course, like I said earlier, as I was explaining, I, I also mentioned about the clotting factors, which are also produced in the liver. Of course, they are, if, if the liver function is affected, that is also, those factors are deranged. The liver cannot even perform its clotting um, function again. So it can perform that function of clotting blood. So, Everything that normally the liver should do to and perform, yes, yes. Once there is a liver disease, we have this affected, you know, and of course you see patient presenting with all, um, all sorts of complications as a result of that. Does the, have I answered your question? Yes, doc. Yes, Good. you did. Um, so this um the next question is um does hepatitis is there um a drug that cures hepatitis? Is it curable? Is hepatitis as is it curable? Okay, so um it depends on the type of hepatitis you're looking at. Mm? If it is hepatitis A. It's um, fecal it's an acute hepatitis, it is a self-limiting, so um, it will resolve most of the time, resolve on its own. But for hepatitis B, even some hepatitis B, if it is acute, it will still resolve on its own. Do you understand? Hepatitis C has treatment. So for somebody who comes down with hepatitis B, use the right medication, he still can resolve if it doesn't progress to the chronic um, form. But once it becomes chronic, particularly hepatitis B and hepatitis B and, sorry, hepatitis B and C, C. or hepatitis B co-infection with D, most of the time, um, if it has progressed to the chronic form, um, there may not be definitive treatment for it. However, there are drugs that can be used that can slow down the progression. And of course, you need to monitor these patients over time. You need to give them, um, they will do their liver enzymes, they will do their um, hepatitis B, viral load, DNA, they will do their panel tests to know if they are they are seroconverted if they are converted from the acute, you know, uh, if they are they are no longer effective, you know, all those tests will help you, you know. And it's not all forms of um, hepatitis. So for the C, there are curable drugs for it. Uh, so for Spursver is one of it, even for B, because of course, if you have some co um, morbidities, some conditions with hepatitis B. Mm -hmm. uh, you still need to treat. If it's a decompensated liver disease, you still have to mm -hmm. treat, irrespective of uh, maybe your um, level of viral load or um, your liver enzyme. So, um, yes, some are curable. The acute ones will resolve, can resolve completely, mm -hmm. but the chronic one um, might not resolve. Hepatitis C itself has a drug and it can cure 
it, it can be curable. Hepatitis B, there are drugs to slow down. We have tenofovir, we have lamivudin. I, I'm sure most people are conversant with lamivudin. Uh, we have um, entricitab, entecava is also another drug uh, that can be used. Entricitab can also be used. So those are the um, medications that we can use to um, treat hepatitis. So uh, have I answered the question? Okay, so thank you, Doc. Yes, you have. So we have a question from Evan Promise, which says, how much med can, medication can one take before it becomes risky or bad for the liver? Because you mentioned earlier that um, taking of antibiotics and some drugs yeah. can actually lead to that, yes. Okay, so um, uh, I won't say there is a limit to the amount. I think um, it's individual-based. And for some people, they can use the medications for life without even having um, any sort of complications, any sort of, uh, um, you know, um, outcome from that. But for some people, even the first dose, and that's why you see some people, some sulfur-containing medications, um, some people cannot tolerate it. They, they don't use it. Things like septrin, things, drugs like Fancida, they don't uh, tolerate it because sometimes you don't know how this person will react to it. It can affect the liver directly, even the first dose. But sometimes they will say that if you use such medications, you have maybe a little rash. The next time you're using it, it can be worse outcome that you will have. So once you notice that, okay, there is a particular medication that makes you feel um, funny, even common drugs like aspirin, it's sometimes uh, um, not good. So as good as paracetamol, as it looks like, oh, it's just these common drugs that we, we can swallow. It's, it can induce so many things in, in, in so many um, conditions. Even the, the paracetamol you're using to treat headache can also induce migraine, you know. So you never can tell when... Um, uh, how how much of it you you need to use because you know there are various drugs, oral contraceptive pills and all of that. So uh, there, there is no particular um, um, cap to how much of it you can take or how. But I think it depends. It varies with individuals who can now um, present with um, uh, you know can have um, worse outcomes from taking the medications and it can induce hepatitis. All right, thank you, Doc. Um, so the next question I'm going to ask now is that um, the, um, the risk of dialysing um, hepatitis B-related kidney disease patient compared with HIV-associated patients? Okay, the risk of dialysing... Um, Hepatitis B related kidney disease patient. So that the patient um, with that HIV has, that yes. has HIV co infection with hepatitis. Yes, yes. Um, okay. Compared to a patient okay. that, um, yes, yes. That just as, um, okay. So if I get you right, um, the question is um, you're comparing the outcome for a patient with um, just hepatitis on dialysis to a patient um, with HIV and yes. hepatitis on dialysis. Yes. That's yes. It. Okay. So um, hepatitis, HIV co-infection, um, of course, um, the outcome it's different. A patient with just um, chronic hepatitis with no HIV co-infection would always... Um, have better outcomes than the one with um, hepatitis and HIV. Um, and the reason is um, because, um, of course, if care is not taken, the person with HIV co-infection with hepatitis B can now develop resistance to some of these uh, medications. And of course, the outcome is poorer for that person than um, and, than person with just chronic hepatitis. Now, it still depends on how advanced this um, chronic hepatitis, uh, sorry, it depends on how advanced this kidney disease 
or is, you know, for someone with end stage renal disease, um, and for someone with maybe on a stage four uh, with a chronic um, stage four with um, what's it called with um, HIV, HIV, uh, HIV, yeah. HIV, yes. So um, the outcome sometimes for most centers it's it's really challenging for them because most centers will tell you that a dialysis machine we don't dialyze people with hiv hmm? we don't dialyze people with hepatitis b so if they have to do that they have to go to another center whereby they can dialyze them so other than the the the, the progression if 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 you are not aggressive with your management, the progression is is a progression to an end stage renal disease or to renal shutdown is is worse than for people with just um, chronic hepatitis without any co-infection with it. So uh, I would say that um, for those that have chronic hepatitis, it's better outcome for them than those with um, HIV co-infection. Of course, some of the medications that are used to treat, and for anybody who has HIV, hepatitis, co-infection, it should be treated because, um, you know, some of those medications that they have, that they use to treat um, hepatitis are equally used to treat HIV. And as a matter of fact, you should start them on things like telofovar, lamivudine, but then, because Tenofovir now, um, if care is not taken, some of it, uh, uh, if the kidney function is not really good, particularly the Tenofovir, you can't use Tenofovir. So most of the time, they will now advocate that you use the different form of Tenofovir. We call it Tenofovir a la phenamide, which is very, is still has less than complications as compared with the common ones that we see around that disoproxil. So um, I think it's better outcome for a person with just HIV, with hepatitis B as compared with the one with um, co-infection with HIV. All right, thank you, Doc. Um, so for our last question for today, Doc, um, so I'm going to be asking, what are the lifestyle modifications or dietary um, considerations that can actually supplement medical treatment and support liver health in chronic hepatitis patients? Okay, so I have mentioned um, before now uh, the kind of um, diet you should take. I can remind us um, things like um, um, high fiber diet, um, Cruciferous vegetables like uh, cabbage, we see that commonly everywhere, particularly in Abuja uh, and even all parts of the country. You can easily get cabbage, cauliflower, you can get that in the market, uh, broccoli. Uh, they'll say Brussels sprouts. We don't really have that here, but the ones we have, we can get beans, is very good. We can, that's readily available. Eggs, whole grains fruits grapefruit is also very good you know um olive oil is good to use berries like i mentioned earlier blueberries um you know and then juice like a beetroot is also good green tea they will say is good low fat milk is good and of course i've told us what to avoid so eating well eating right will help uh, improve our liver health particularly in patients with chronic hepatitis. Of course, if you are obese, uh, it's important to try and work on your weight, reduce, um, you know, try and work on your weight reduction. And um, of course, we have what we call non-alcoholic fatty liver, which can also um, progress to the chronic uh, chronic form, uh, if not well taken care of, it, which can cause complications if not well taken care of. Of course, um, you have to increase your uh, physical activity. Uh, you know, they, it's recommended that you do a minimum of 50, 150 minutes um, moderate intensity activity per week, or you do a minimum of 30 minutes a day, five times a week. So it's important we increase our um, physical activity 
and of course that will also help the liver health of i've mentioned um, balanced diet i've mentioned weight reduction i've mentioned increase in physical activity of course those food that i listed they have um, antioxidants you know contain specific antioxidants that are good to help support the liver function i've told us what to avoid red meat processed meats processed food uh, full cream dairy products um, alcohol intake we should do all of that and of course um, liver health will be will be optimal thank you very much doc um so this um before we go i'm just going to remind us that this webinar was brought to us by complete care and complete care is a digital health marketplace that connects patients with doctors and other health care professionals within the shortest time possible complete care is your sure health plug for convenient affordable and quality health care thank you so much to our viewers for joining us this evening to help celebrate the world hepatitis day and thank you so much dr kindly for explaining um extensively to us and making us understand better what hepatitis is and now we can take care of our liver so please, we should, um, just like um, Dr. Kenny has said, we should work on our diet. We should eat well and also exercise right. If we're vegan, also we can eat fruits. And so hepatitis, because I know this is bringing a lot of awareness to a lot of people. Some people believe it's not treatable at all yes i know a lot of people believe it's not treatable so please like we've heard it's treatable please we should get tested so we can know our status and know how to take care of ourselves so thank you very much everyone for joining this evening thank you dr kendo once more thank you for thanks joining for us. having me You're welcome, thank you so much thank you for having me thank you welcome so this brings us have you ever visited a hospital this brings us to the end of this webinar series. So see you next time on Complete Care webinar series. Have a good night to rest, everyone. Bye. Good night. Good night. Have you ever visited a hospital and spent more than 30 minutes waiting to obtain a hospital card? After obtaining the card, wait another 30 minutes to see a doctor. How did these waits make you feel? What if I told you you could consult your doctor on your mobile device for non-life-threatening conditions anytime, anywhere? Wouldn't that be great? How, you ask? By registering at www.completecare.com. This registration is free and simple. You not only get to consult a doctor on your mobile device, but can book appointments to see your doctor at the hospital. Better still, you could have your doctor visit you at home. Isn't that wonderful? Enter your details here and experience the easiest and fastest access to a doctor or hospital. Do you know that this reduces the cost of you consulting medical experts and the logistics of doing so by 30 to 70%? Do you know that this reduces the time you spend in hospital to the barest minimum and gives you time to attend to other things? Do you know that you can pay online when you need medical care and enjoy the best of medical care from qualified medical doctors from anywhere and anytime? Hurry now and register and benefit from cutting-edge healthcare revolution in Nigeria.